bringing a series of talks on worship. I gave the first yesterday morning. More to follow consecutively, though I'm not certain how many. In the 45th Psalm, verse 11 is the texting. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord. Worship thou him. Then, I'll add that text from John 4, 24. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I will deal only slightly with that last text because I want to read a whole sermon from it, God willing, before I'm finished with the series. Now here is the truth we build, or rather the truth that we're trying to develop. That God made everything for a purpose, man to worship him. That is man's chief end and the reason for his existence. Fell by sin and has now only a foggy idea of what worship is and has lost the object of his worship. Now, this morning I want to mention this. He wants us to worship him. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty. It is one of the most touching and the most awe-inspiring truths that I know in the scriptures, that God wants to have us love him and admire him and adore him. Now, he doesn't need us. In us, he would not be the self-sufficient God. But self-sufficiency is one of the attributes of the deity. If God needed him, be God. He doesn't need us, for he existed in perfect, uh, in a perfect, uh, infinite millenniums before we were created. But he wants us for reasons known to himself. So shall he desire thy beauty. When Adam sinned, it was not Adam who ran crying, God, where art thou? It was God who came crying, Adam, where art thou? It was God seeking his recent worshiper who had stopped worshiping. And it is written in the New Testament, Thou shalt worship God. It's a command. God wants us to worship him. And in Second Thessalonians 1.10, it refers to the outcome to be glorified in his saints and admired in all them that believe. Now those are what we call proof texts. But more convincing than all proof texts or any proof texts is the whole import of the Bible teaching about a thing. <clears throat> For you preachers who may be present, I might drop this little word. The whole drift of the Bible is not in the direction of a doctrine. Go easy on the doctrine. You may find a text that sounds as something, but if the rest of the Bible is away from that, don't teach it yet. Uh, search to find out the teachers by the whole drift and direction of the Scriptures. If the whole tenor of the Bible doesn't teach it, it probably isn't taught in the Scriptures. And the whole tenor of the Bible is toward this, that God created man for the purpose of him, and that man sinned and no longer worships him, though there is still in the heart of a man learning to worship. Now that's the odd contradiction in the human nature, that there is in the human heart a longing, a desire for worship. So to him, which I'd like to just read a brief one, Eternal power whose high abode becomes the grandeur of a god. Finite lengths beyond the bounds where stars revolve their little rounds. Thee, while the first archangel sings, he hides behind his wings, and ranks of shining thrones around fall, worshiping and spread the ground. Lord, what shall earth and... That's us. Lord, what shall earth and ashes do? We would adore our maker too. From sin and die, the great, the holy, and the high. The great theologian and hymnist Watts here felt that, which is been, he felt that frightful incongruity between a, an ancient yearning to worship and the inability to because of sin. 
he felt this and called himself dust and ashes and said he yearned to worship the great, the whole. How could he do it, being dust and ashes? Now, I say that men want to worship, but worship just any way that we will. And this is really what I want to talk about this morning. This is vastly important. Those to worship him has decreed how we shall worship him. Now, I'm going to shock your everlasting um, evangelical fun brains this morning, but I am both an evangelical and a fundamentalist. But I want to say this to you, that authentic religious experience is possible apart from Christ. You can have authentic religious experience without Christ being in it at all. You can have religious experience without Christ being there at all. Therefore, if, if by religious experience you mean an aware of the eternal power, if you mean even having some conversation or experience with the Mighty One, you can have that and not be saved. You can have that and not be converted at all. Look at Cain. Cain had a thick religious experience. God spoke to him, and he spoke to God. Stop. That was consciousness that God was, was hearing, and that he was replying to God, and God was hearing him, and yet Cain was Cain, with a black mark upon him. Carrot. Judas Carrot was not a Christian. He was never born again. He was the son of perdition, and belonged to perdition place, and that's where he went. And yet Judas Iscariot talked to God and heard God speak and experienced the warm presence of the man who was God. Judas Iscariot had authentic religious experience, but a living experience. Now I go a step further and say it's possible not only to have authentic religious experience without Christ, it's possible to have authentic worship without Christ. That is, it's possible to admire, it's possible, it's possible to surrender and give yourself to some God and yet not be worshiping the true God and his Christ. You know, I'm interested and have been for many years in the old pagans and their worship in days gone by. Olympus, where their gods were, in later times, in Scandinavian times, they have the, called it the Valhalla, where they had their God, uh, from which we get our word Thursday, and uh, Freya, from which we get our word Friday, and uh, many other such gods. They now, scholars have dismissed this with a shrug, and they've said that Thor and Zeus and Jupiter and Venus and Eun, the gods of the old uh, Olympia, that they were simply make-believes, that those old fellows were kidding, that they didn't rely or reject that bully and says, I do not believe that these men were fooling. I believe that these men were having authentic experiences, that they were meeting someone somewhere or that they fought with somebody and were honest men seeking God with all my heart. I do not believe the doctrines of, uh, of the old pagans could ever have originated if it had, that they were finding something somewhere and getting through to something or somebody, and yet they were not saved. They were not worshiping, accepted their worship. Take those Baalites, for instance, up there who jumped on the altar. They were not Roman or Greek gods. They were the gods of, of uh, the Hebrew days. But they jumped on the altar, and they cut themselves, and they cried, Baal, here. They were putting on a show. No. They were sincere about that. They never would have accepted Elijah's bold challenge if it in their God. They were, having re re they were having religious experience. Once I saw in Mexico an old church without any floor in it, an old dirt floor Catholic church with the statue of the Virgin and the saints around there. I saw an old Mexican leathery face come in and set her shopping bag down beside her and then kneel in front of a statue of the Virgin, extend, put her hands together, and with open eyes gaze adoringly, with worship in her face, at the statue of the Virgin Mary. See, that poor old lady was fooling. She was not. She was sincere, more sincere than a lot of flippant fundamentalists are. Sincere. She was worshiping something. Her heart was going out to something. I say you can have experience without Christ and apart from salvation altogether. And the very reason that idolatry is that it is real. 
If it were not real, God could ignore it. But because it is real, God hates it. First Corinthians, the Holy Ghost says this, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devil God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot board table and the table of devils. The Holy Ghost recognized through his servant Paul that those pagans who made were not fooling. They were worshiping something. And they had a subjective experience of authentic worship, sacrificing to devils nevertheless. And Paul said, never do it. Stay away from it. Keep the separating wall as wide as the world, the table of the Lord and the table of devils. Now, God has accepted only the worship which he himself has declared. He has accepted and does accept only that worship which is inspired by the Holy Spirit and truth. He must worship the Spirit and in truth. I want to point out this morning, and in doing this it won't be pleasant, but I have found that you can't all preach the truth. I have found that a lot of men have hurt the kingdom of God by being fighters all the time, but other men have not because they would rather be nice than be true. I'd much rather be true than to be nice. I don't care whether anybody says, isn't he a nice man? I certainly want them to say after I'm gone he preached the truth. So I'm going to give you some truth here that is not going to be nice. And so wish I'd drop dead and there are a few of them throughout the country. Why, uh, you will be able to go out and say, well, it was negative. Of course, but in knows that you couldn't run this microphone unless you had a negative and a positive element. You can't. You've got to have negative and positive. Everything Polaroid. I don't know whether that's a good word or not, but it ought to be. There are two sides to two poles to everything. North and south, two poles, two poles to truth. If you don't get rid of that which is false, you won't know when you see the truth. So I want to mention the four or five kinds of rejects openly and will have nothing to do with. One of them is what we call Cain's worship. Now, Cain's worship is atonement. It is worship that does not trust in atonement as its way in. And worship or religious experience of any kind without atonement rests upon three errors, three bases to you. Worship without atonement, without blood, rests upon the erroneous God is a different kind of being from what he is. Now, God is exactly what he is, and he always was, what, and always will be what he now is and always was. There is no change in God. But there are changes in conceptions of God. And uh, the man without a blood sacrifice who tries to worship is assuming that God is of God from what he is. They don't believe he's as holy as he says he is. They don't believe that he's as righteous as he says he is. They believe that God is, is easier to get on with and uh, that he's a good fellow and will all be well, as the poet said. They believe the actress called him a uh, good old God. They believe that he is what another one uh, said about him, that he's a living doll. That, that kind of God, a nice old chap who's very kind, will be there to help you when you're in trouble. Now, that's king based upon a false concept of God. Then the second error is that it assumes that man occupies God, which he does not, in fact, occupy. Those who try to worship God without the blood of Jesus Christ, or even trust in atonement, believe that they occupy by, by nature a relation to God which they in fact occupy. Nobody is born a child of God the first time. Hear me. Nobody is born a child of God the first time. That is God till it comes out of his mouth, eyes, and ears. And Mary is a young woman who loves God till her face shines with the glory of God. The baby, that baby is not a Christian. That baby is born into the world a son of Adam or daughter of Adam as it might be. Atonement covers a child until it reaches the age of accountability. But that child is not born anew till it is consciously born anew. Atonement by accepting Christ as Lord and Savior, not as Savior only, but as Lord and Savior, and trusting the blood to cleanse from sin. Uh, it, it rests, this Cain worship rests upon a false assumption 
That sin is less serious than it is. Oh, we have fixed up sin now. We've baptized it. We, we, we've circumcised it. And uh, we have brought it into the church, and it is a fair now. Brother Brown said to me in conversation, or did he say it here last night in his sermon? I know I heard him say it recently. That, uh, that uh, we used to repent and get convicted, convicted over things that we now let pass. Follow in the alliance. If anybody lost his temper, they said, you're out of victory, brother. And he had to get right, get the blood on him. And get nowadays, people get red-faced and lose their temper. Maybe they're Bible school presidents or, or professors or pastors. And about it, said the Reverend blew his top. And the next day, the brother has recollected his top. And uh, he gets up and uh, with the typical nasal intonation, he preaches. And everybody thinks he's a holy man. He's not a holy man. No man is a holy man until he has made his temper to be something else than the devilish thing that we know it to be. Well, then there is another God rejects outright, and that is Samaritan worship, the kind of worship that they had. You see, they were heretics in the correct... A heretic, as you may know, heresy rather, is picking and choosing. That's what the word means. A heretic is somebody who rejects the Bible... He is somebody who picks out what he wants to believe and neglects the rest. A heretic is not somebody who rejects all Christian doctrine. He is somebody who likes certain Christian doctrine and emphasizes that and either rejects or neglects the rest. That's a heresy according to the etymological meaning of the word heresy. Now, the Samaritans were heretics in that sense. They were Jew and Gentile, more Gentile than Jew, but they did believe in Moses and the prophets and they had the scriptures or at least a part of them. So the Samaritans were not pagans, and they were not Jews. They were an Irish stew, a hodgepodge, a cross between the two. They believed in Jehovah and in the fathers and in the prophets. They didn't believe that God dwelt in Jerusalem and that they that worshipped should worship, and that the altar in Jerusalem was the center of worship. They, they, they didn't believe a lot of things they should have believed, and they believed a lot of things they They were heretics. They selected and rejected. And I find a lot of Christianity like that today. We neglect what we want to believe and neglect what we don't or reject. No, nobody here would ever reject anything in the Scripture. You'd be afraid to. You'd be afraid it's going to out at you. If you ever, if you ever outright rejected anything, but you neglect it. And to neglect the thing, you can neglect it diet just as the same as you can if you hit it over the head with an axe. All you have to do is let your baby die and let him lie there for five days. You come back, he'll be good and dead. All you have to do to kill anything is neglect it. And all we have to do to kill a truth is neglect it. Incidentally, I'd like to say this, the Lord to hear me that will. I am bothered by the fact that there is a neglected truth, and that is the truth of this, is being neglected in alliance circles. You don't hear it at all. One of the first things that shocked me when I reached Toronto a year and a half ago to take was that nobody up there believes in the coming of Christ anymore. They're all millennialists or they're non-millennialists or they're post something else, but nobody preaches that, you know what I'm going to do? Starting the beginning of next month, I'm going back and preach a series on the book of Revelation. And I'm not an expert on the book of Revelation, but uh, possibly I know more about it than they think. And I'm going to preach premillennial eschatology. Hey, you know what eschatology is? You heard about the dear old bishop. When he was an old man and had been around seminary so long, church change, he got up one day and wiped his eyes and said, Brethren, he said, uh, when I was a young fellow, they talked about heaven. Now they're about eschatology. He said, I don't want to die and go to an eschatology. I want to die and go to heaven the way my father is dead. Now, uh, Samaritan worship is the neglect of worship. That is, it's the neglect of certain elements, presence of things that shouldn't be there. Then there's another kind of worship, which God rejects. Now, mark you, I want to say boldly, and a lady said about said Jesus Christ was God. She went out and she said the disgusting arrogance of that man, that he would insist that we believe that Jesus, disgustingly arrogant or not, I still believe it, brethren. And I believe that he is God. I'm saying here now to you with what I hope will be gentle dogmatism. I want to be a dogmatist, for the man dogmatist ought to be selling insurance. He ought not to be in the pulpit. 
that he can't get up and say, this is the wind. He has no call from God at all. But I want to be a gentle dogmatist because if you're not gentle, you can hurt unnecessarily. Well, nature worship now. Nature worship, that is not the worship of natural worship. And worship in the presence of nature, that, it's the poetry of religion. It is a horrible uh, experience that comes from contemplating the sublime. When I was a young fellow, I studied uh, phrenology. Now, phrenology is a thoroughly discredited and repudiated pseudoscience, so don't get But I, just for the fun of it, I studied phrenology, and I used to read people's heads, you know. Well, phrenology says that, uh, that you can head by the bumps on the outside of the head. The way, the way I got cured of that was by a statement made by Oliver Wendell Holmes. He well try to find out how many five dollars there bills there are in a safe by feeling the outside of the safe is to find out what the man feeling the outside of his head. And after I read that I said, Amen, I got it. There's no use fooling with that. But anyhow, you got here over your ears, those are your bumps that give you bad temper. And uh, then there's a bump up here somewhere that makes you love ladies and uh, men a bad bump there, they're Earl Carroll's, you know, and so on. And uh, then there's a bump right here. It's called the bump of sublimity. That means if you've got that bump, there's something in your head that loves the sublime. You walk around looking at the fir trees and say how wonderful they are. On now deep and dark blue out ocean roll, 10,000 fleets sweep over thee in vain. You know, all that stuff. That's sublimity, you know. And uh, that's up there. Well, now I suppose that's true. Uh, uh, I don't say, say you can tell it up there. Naturally live for the sublime. Jacob had a sublimity about him. I'm just now reading again in my own private reading of the scriptures. I've come. Jacob was a scoundrel of a fellow, but he had something in him that yearned after God. He had a bump of sublimity as big as somewhere up there on his head. Well... That a lot of people have that, and so they go around in a in a glow of naturally a glow of wonder. They look at the birds and the flowers and all, and they feel so good and everything so wonderful. They think that's that's not worshiping God, brother. That's admiring God's handiwork, and the devil can do that. Nature worship is the concentration of the mind upon beauty, as distinct from the eye or the ear. Your ear listens to pure concentrating upon beauty with your ear. Your eye looks upon the scenery and you're looking, you're, you're worshiping, you're enjoying. And when your mind contemplates sublimity, then you're having an experience above all the others. But it's not worship yet. Worship, it's not truly the worship of God. Emerson said that he went out, he would go out into the fields after a walk beside the woods, over the meadows with little puddles of water about, and the moon struggling through the clouds lately brim. And he said, I would feel so good that I felt scared. He was in gear with nature. He was a good in gear with nature. And nature came and blessed him and lifted him until he felt so, so wrapped that he felt afraid. A lot of that, a lot of it. And some people mistake the music of religion and the rapture of, of, of nature. They mistake that for worship. Go into some churches and they do everything possible to take an old sinner and make him worship. They have candles and uh, bells, pictures of the Virgin and pictures of angels and pictures of Jesus with babies on his lap. And the music is low and soft up and down the aisle. They walk as quiet as mice on a rug. And everything is soft. The preacher, when he gets up, has a voice that never be deep and sonorous and uh, very religious. And uh, they go out, and they're, they're scoundrels when they come in, scoundrels when they go out. And they'll be scoundrels all week. They'll tell dirty stories. They'll cut the corners in business. They'll abuse their wife. They'll tell dirty stories. One day, they'll come back into that holy place and feel religious again and enjoy the sonorous tones of the pastor and the bass of the organ. But they're sinners nevertheless. God rejects that whole business. He rejects that whole day. And now God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit. The word must clear away all and take worship out of the hands of men and put worship in the hands of God where it belongs. 
You know, uh, I was not too many years ago, and I heard one of the celebrated, fun, uh, celebrated modernist preachers uh, of the country preach. And he, this we ask in the spirit of Jesus. Others pray in the spirit of good. And some pray to the All-Father. And some pray in good. You go into some of our new hymn books, and you'll find whole sections, particularly those hymn books that were edited back there to half a generation. Social Gospel was writing in the saddle high. They were talking about brotherhood and service instead of heaven and eschatology. It was service. Well, now that's all right, I suppose, if it's done out of a loving heart filled with the Holy Ghost. But brethren, God is God. There's only one God. And Jesus Christ is his Son, and there's only one Son of God. And Christ said that we came, we come unto him. We, we're not seeking for God. We found him. If we come to Christ, found him. There's a lot of self-pity and a lot of pride in this seeking after God. People say, oh, we're seeking it, but I'm a seeker for God. I think there's a good deal in that that ought to be exposed as phony. God is in Christ Jesus the Lord. You know, there are certain types of poets, and uh, I, uh, being an editor, I, uh, some of them, you know, old maids of both sexes, they uh, write poetry. I've been a lover of poetry since I was in my teens, and much as the average man, and still do. But uh, I can't take this religious poetry that pretends it's seeking after God. Let me give you a here now, not to... Uh, to um, uh, oh, to lampoon the man, he's dead, let him sleep. Uh, to point out, it's a sample, and a great many others have been written. If you get a great big thick books on religious poetry, you'll find a whole just like this. Now listen to this fellow. The, the pattern is all the same. I went out seeking God. I went everywhere seeking God because I didn't find God, and then I saw a little baby smile, and I found God. Well, this, this fellow's name is Edwin Markham. You ever put this on the air clear with them on the copyright because uh, I'm afraid it's going to cut this one part out. He says, I made a pilgrimage. Now, that was an American writing that. Out there somewhere near Dr. Brown there he lived. And he was a great poet. He wrote The Man with the Hoe and Lincoln. And he, but when he came to religion, he was a woozy-headed old maid. And uh, here's what he said. I made a pilgrimage to find the God. I was born in a land with a church at every crossroads and on every city corner, in a, in a, in a, in a land where Rudy and Finney and Beecher and Edwards and Cotton Mather and all the rest. He refers to our Father which art in heaven as the God. He takes on a pagan phrase. I made a pilgrimage to find the God, noble boy. What a noble God ought to take him to heaven just for trying and all here. And he said, I listened for his voice. Of now, what would God be in a holy mausoleum for? I listened for his voice at holy tombs. No wonder he didn't him. He was listening in a holy tomb, he said. But you know, this takes on a very highly religious flavor right here. You know, gets out a silk camera handkerchief and wipes her eyes right here. I, I listened for his voice at holy tombs. Searched for the print of his immortal feet in the dust of broken altars. Now, what altars there were, he didn't say, because he was an American. And uh, there weren't any pagan altars in America. But somewhere he was around looking among the broken altars for God. What kind of a dusty God was he looking for? And here's the old pattern. Yet I turned back with empty heart. Poor father. He couldn't find God in the tomb nor in the dust of a bro Then suddenly he gets, he gets uh, illuminated, he says. And on the homeward road a great light came upon And I heard God's voice singing in the nestling lark. There you have it. That's the type, you know. That's Christianity without Christian, without blood, without atonement. That's seeking after God naturally. That's at Esau. Well, he said that he, he heard God's voice in the nestling lark. Now, I don't like to embarrass him, but the fact is nestling. <laughs> not, only, not only was his theology offbeat, but his own was also considerably uh, inadequate. And then he said, 
I felt his sweet swaying rose. Look at that. Isn't that a pretty rose? Smell it. I received his blessing from a wayside well and looked on lover's face. Saw some young fellow coming along embarrassedly holding his girlfriend's hand. He said, look, there's God. <laughs> Saw his bright hands from the sun. Now, that was Edwin Markham, a man who was brought up in a Protestant country with a Bible he should have known. But there is no fool more perfectly foolish than the man who has truth. The person who is seeking truth may be very wise as he seeks. But the man who has rejected God just smears his face over with mud. They let him have it. Read Romans 1 and see what God did when they refused to have the thought of God in their heart. God turned them over to reprobate minds. And there are poets writing reprobate poetry everywhere, all doing the same, never finding him, last finding him in a rose. Well, amen. Spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now that's what truth incarnate said. And that word in spirit and in truth. We worship God, we must submit to truth. And we must submit to truth to five uh, subjects. On five subjects. We must, we must admit to truth about God. Nobody can worship who believes that God is any other than what he is. And nobody can worship God acceptably who rejects anything that be true about himself. True theology must rest upon what God has declared to be true about himself. They must believe what God has declared to be true about Christ. I cannot worship God unless I accept what Christ is. I miss what he says he is. Now that doesn't mean that I am instantaneously to believe all about him because it'll take eternity all the glories that shine around the person of our Lord. But I am to believe everything that I'm capable of believing to be true about himself. With all of my heart I believe in the deity of Jesus Christ the Lord. I believe that the God, man who walked the earth, believe that the man who is at the throne is God. And I believe that the God who is beside the Father there is man. And that if you were to look you would see a man there with manly lineaments and manly features and a manly shape and a manly form as by it, but alive again forevermore, a man at the right hand of God. Dr. Brown, when I first came into the Alliance, the preachers used to talk about the man in the glory. We don't much anymore. We, the, 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 a man wrote me this. The brother, the brother of Walter Wilson, of Dr. Walter Dyke, wrote me this. He said, Brother Tozer, I have tested out, I have tested preachers. He said, I have made a, what do you call it? And he told me how many, quite a number. Probably not enough to be scientific if you're actually going in science, but enough to satisfy him that he, he was on the right path. I have made a survey and I have asked the preachers, do you believe that Jesus Christ is now a man at all? And he said, a pitifully small percent believed that he was a man. Oh, they said he's a spirit. He was a man when he was on earth, and he's a spirit now. And they had all sorts of vague notions about him being at the right hand of God. I believe a man is there, my brother. That man is named Jesus Christ, the Lord, and that when he comes back, he will be a man. He will weigh something. He will stand on his feet and drink. And here he's a man, a true man, at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Don't you let the heretics and the liberals and the nature lovers less than a true man out of Jesus. He's at God's right hand a man, a glorified man forever. The sample man, there is a sample of what you're going to be when you're glorified at his second coming. Well, to worship God acceptably, a man must have been redeemed, and he must have been born anew. Thank God. Born anew is to be regenerated. Regenerated is a good, sound theological word. Born anew is a popular term. Born again. It means that God implants a new kind of life in the body, in the soul, within the soul. And that, that whole thing lies in the human body, the temple of the Holy Ghost. And then he must have to be truly and indeed worship God. He must have an infusion of the spirit of truth. When we neglect the Holy Spirit, we're neglecting the living pulse of the church. When we neglect the, neglecting the life battery that gives life to everything that is of God.
cannot worship without the Spirit. You can worship in the Spirit, but you can't worship without Him. You get into moral confusion. And that is why we try to worship in the ways that I have mentioned, ways that have been specifically rejected. I wasn't going to be nice, and I wasn't. But I hope that I was gently dogmatic about this. Let people say that's arrogance. Okay, let them say that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Except ye be born again, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Except ye repent, ye Those are dogmatic statements. They're arrogant statements, if you like. But they're as true as the throne of God. The human heart has fallen into moral confusion, and we're trying to worship God just any old way. We've got every kind of cult imaginable. I thought I got to Canada, I'd get away from all that. I'm mistaken. They got it up there, too. Everywhere. You can't overemphasize the simple, basic, fundamental doctrines of the faith. You can't go too far in continuing to teach them line upon line, precept upon precept, until you think differently in your psychology. Psychology. He said about Keats that he was an Englishman, but that he had a Greek mind. He'd studied Greek, he had a Greek mind. They said about Milton, he was an Englishman, but he'd read the scriptures till he had a Hebraic mind. I believe it possible in the midst of the busy United States, the busy Canada. I believe it entirely possible with television, radio, everything around, buzzing round about me to study the scriptures so much and to live so in the spirit that I have a Christian mind. I can have a Christian mind in such a world as this. Dr. Simpson said in one of his great sermons, a lily can grow in a manure pile. A lily, he said, can come up out of the refuse pile, oh, rotten and decay. But in the middle of it, she can rise and spread her fragrant to the sky and stand in it, but free from it. So we can grow in a world that's but grow free from it and have purity and whiteness and holiness and have a Christian heart and a Christian mind in our philosophy and reject from us all of this woozy Cain religion and Samaritan religion and live like first century Christians in a wild, violent 20th century. Amen. Father, we pray thy blessing upon what's been being human, Lord. Maybe some things were said that shouldn't have been said. Expunge them from our minds. Everything that should impress them upon our minds. May we go out from here humbly glad we're Christians. Humbly glad for our fathers who taught us the Bible. For our fathers who translated the Bible for us. For our fathers for us. For our fathers who wrote expositions and commentaries and, and devotional books and beat our hearts on in a day of pollution and pornography. Great God, we thank thee for all the good men, thee for every worshiping saint. We thank thee for Wesley, who wrote these great hymns and Grant and Watts and Montgomery. We thank thee for that fountain of all hymnology, David, who now didst to stand and say, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. God help us today. As we go out from here, we pray we may go all the beauties that are about us, but appreciate him as Christians, seeing him not as pagans, but seeing him as Christians, birds and trees, worshiping the God who made the birds and trees. Amen.